We are recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are just letting people in from the waiting room. Just give it a couple, couple minutes here and we'll get started. Thanks everyone for being here. Welcome again. All right, just a quick note to everybody who's here that this session is being recorded. Um, we also have closed captions turned on and so those should be available on your end for those who need them just by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna wait maybe, maybe 30 seconds here for more people to join, but then we will get started. All right, I think we have a good amount of people in. Uh, just another note for those who didn't hear before, this session is being recorded. Um, closed captions are turned on on our end, so they should be available for anyone who needs them by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I am Kaya, I'm with Bike Pittsburgh. I am going to hand things over to Eric, who is our advocacy director, who is the main man for today, and we'll get started with E. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining. And uh, happy Bike Anywhere week uh, this Tuesday. And we got a beautiful week so far. So hopefully people are biking somewhere. Um, thanks for the intro, Kea. Uh, um, my name is Eric Bohr. I'm the advocacy director of Bike Pittsburgh. Um, and a brief sort of overview. I've been with the organization for a really long time. <laughs> I'm sort of the resident historian of, of um, you know, bike infrastructure and, and the organization in general. And um, so what I'm, what I'm hoping to do with this uh, presentation today is to give a brief overview of sort of bike planning in Pittsburgh in general and how it culminated in this, uh, this past year and a half so far um, in this move forward PGH program. Uh, is, okay, is the race hand feature on, or is that, can people use that uh, just that should be on, and you can okay. also type questions in the chat as uh, you're going forward, and I will kind of keep track of people who have questions. We can get to them at the at the end once you're done your presentation. Got it. I was going to ask for a show of hands to see who's seen imagery similar to this uh, somewhere in the in the world over the past year or so. Um, if you if you wanted to use the raise hand feature, I, I am just kind of curious if you've seen it or not. Um, Okay, because hopefully you have. <laughs> um, so why why did this 
whole thing happen? What's going on? You know, even even among you do have to unraise your hand too. So after you're done, <laughs> um, the um, thanks for that. By the way, thanks for humoring me on that. Um, so what is this whole program? A lot of people still don't quite understand. You know, like what's going on with it? What what it even is? So I'm just going to give a quick overview first of bike planning. Um, in Pittsburgh and then go into this program, like I said. So, oops, come on, here we go. In the beginning, um, we had a 1999 bike plan. Um, that's the plant bike plan that we've been working off of for basically, well, for the last 20 some odd years. Um, it was, so even up to a couple years ago, we were working off of a 1999 bike plan. It was the oldest bike plan in the whole country next to Aurora, Colorado, who had one in 2006. And it's basically what we've been using until June of 2020. Just a brief, uh, to brief, if you uh, to, to think back to 1999, um, Mayor Murphy was the uh, was the mayor, which today, you know, as you know, is a is an election day. The Eliza Furnace Trail was brand new, um, while bits of there were like little bits of riverfront trail that existed. Uh, the only on-street bike lanes in the whole city were Beachwood Boulevard and Highland Park and the Riverview Park loops. There were zero, zero curbside bike racks. There was no city bike map. Port Authority buses did not have bike racks on the front. Um, so you couldn't combine bikes and transit. And Pittsburgh was consistently ranked at the bottom of Bicycling Magazine's best bicycling uh, city list. In fact, getting worse bicycling city. Um, so since then, um, you know, one thing that a bike plan does is um, kind of outlines what the city wants to accomplish um, in terms of, you know, what like are the goal. So in this goal, in this case, the goal is making the city better for bicycling. So there were a lot of things in that bike plan that did happen, such as the trail system that we see, the hot metal bridge um, was in that bike plan. Um, integrating bikes and transit. There's been a whole lot of work that's been done to make that happen. And just general um, bike lanes in general, um, you know, while not directly out of the, um, the city that we got, we, you know, Bike Pittsburgh produces a, the Pittsburgh bike map, which was something identified in the bike plan. Um, and then, so back in 2012, mm -hmm. we started um, pushing for a new bike plan under Luke Ravenstall. Uh, Luke Ramstall's administration. That took a long time. We got we didn't get very far, and then we had a new mayor, Mayor Peduto, came in, and um, basically he, uh, we we got that plan to a point where almost being published. A new mayor came in who wanted to redo it. Um, so we got to the point now where in June of 2020, we finally um, the city finally published a bike plan called the Bike Plus Plan. And so that plan is, is a pretty important document. Like I said earlier, it's, it's something that um, helps us all understand what's gonna happen, but also gives the city sort of like the direction, sets, sets the expectations for both people who want bike lanes and for people who are, you know, just so that they know what's coming. Um, but it also is important for gaining funding because without an active plan, it's hard to get funding for things. So it, needless to say, getting this plan was a really important thing. Um, so as, as you can read, um, it lays out a vision for a safe and connected network of on-street and off-street facilities. Uh, it's a 10-year plan. So ideally it'll be updated in 2030. Um, and uh, it identifies critical gaps in the existing bike network and begins the process to identify projects that will solve them. So that includes 120 plus miles of new or improved on-street bike facilities, 27 miles of new trails, and also a whole bunch of new policy goals on topics from maintenance of bike infrastructure to micromobility. And I really suggest you guys check that out if you haven't seen it already. Come on. Uh, just really quick, you can see, you can download these maps. I know you can't read them right now, but uh, basically this, it just shows, the left shows what's existing today in terms of on-street bike facilities and, and trails. And the right shows what the, the hopeful future is. So a big part of this whole thing was like, yeah, it sounds great. Glad we're, you know, glad we're doing all this stuff, but you know, we still have to, the public to deal with. And as you know, like bike lanes are contentious. 
they've been, uh, you know, people have been, you know, Bill Peduto got his nickname, Bike Lane Billy, you know, whether he deserved it or not it, um, over, over this whole um, situation. And it's, it's hurt him politically on some, on some, I say, on some level. Um, and um, in short, we just needed to do things like rally bigger and broader support, um, you know, for bike infrastructure. And so how do we do that? Well, one thing that came up was the, um, this Move Forward program. So it's an initiative of the city of Pittsburgh's Department of Mobility and Infrastructure to implement their new Bike Plus plan. So they're working with local nonprofit partners, Bike Pittsburgh, us, and Healthy Ride, uh, to engage the community, to, to think of ways to engage the community through the process of installing new bike-friendly connections uh, throughout Pittsburgh. So to help out with this is an organization called uh, People for Bikes. <clears throat> Where's that? Hold on, I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to go backwards, there we go. <laughs> um, so People for Bikes is a national nonprofit organization um, that is basically an industry group, but they do a lot of lobbying. Um, and they came up with this funding program uh, and support program to help, um, to help cities um, uh, several cities um, impl implement their bike plans. Um, so we are in a cohort of four other cities. So Providence, Denver, uh, uh, Austin, Texas, and New Orleans, um, who all have, you know, similar thing to what's going on with Move Forward um, to, uh, to not only provide funds and resources to help do the physical designing of bike infrastructure, but also with the help with help in marketing it and helping the public understand why it's happening, whether they bike or not, um, and how it can actually help them, um, you know, even if they just drive every day. So that's where this whole less stress, more safety kind of uh, imagery and and um, and uh, messaging came from. All the cities in our cohort, the ones I just mentioned, are all using uh, this. Uh, this similar similar imagery, trying to make it like, you know, I know that's not it's supposed to be like a generic street. Um, it kind of looks like Pittsburgh, I guess. But um, <laughs> the um, the whole idea is to have they they found that um, this they've done a lot of polling and research, and they found that these words less stress, more safety are things that resonate with everybody. Like there's very few people who don't who want more stressful and less safe streets. So they just, but they found the messaging is something that was um, really powerful and, and something that, that helped out. Um, so less confusion, more safety, more joy, all these words were really things that, that they honed in on that, that worked really well with, with you know, to be honest, non-bike riders and, and who, people who are car drivers. Um, sort of the, the underlying theme is there's, well, there will be peace on the road when everyone gets the peace of the road. Um, and, and just really trying to stress that the benefits of bike infrastructure are experienced by all who use the road, whether or not they bike. Um, I do find it a, a, an effective talking point to even say, when I drive, I prefer there to be bike infrastructure because it makes it easier to drive. Um, and it, you know, that I feel like that's something that a lot of people really, really resonate, really resonates with a lot of people. So I'm gonna briefly show a video. I'm guessing you people, everyone on here has seen it. I saw a lot of hands raised. Um, during it, but um, this is the the newest a new video. We so far, well, hold on, I'll, I'll just play it if I can figure out how to do it. Here we go. Okay, hopefully that worked. <laughs> um, Nope, there we go. <laughs> the, um, so the, uh, the, the marketing campaign of all of this involved like, like that video I just showed, billboards, we had bus wraps. Um, I don't have the latest figures at the moment, but um, in, in only a couple months, we saw about 2.9 million impressions um, and 900, almost, a million video views in just in just the first launch of that um, of the campaign. Um, that video uh, has been seen over three hundred thousand times on on YouTube, which is kind of cool. 
Um, so it shows up on, um, that'll show up on social media. I'm sure a lot of you have gotten it. If you probably liked something that was related to bicycling, you've, you've probably gotten it. Um, it had radio spots. It showed up on streaming services like Hulu um, and other streaming services, YouTube, obviously. Um, so we really got, really try to get the word out about this to direct people back to the website. One other thing that People for Bikes provided um, was a polling, polling services. And so um, they recently uh, just finished a poll um, and it was a random poll of 600 people, a phone poll. Everyone took about a half hour on the phone um, and they found um, a whole lot of uh, things that we were pretty excited to see actually. Um, so on the right is a, is a, a WESA um, article about it. But just in short, a lot of everybody agreed with a lot of those statements that, that we were trying to put out there, like less stress, more safety. There, we found that a lot of people have been involved in or know someone who had been involved in a traffic crash and have been injured or have died. Um, and a lot of people agree that one thing that really came out was that 71% agreed that separated bike lanes create more safety and less stress for everyone on the roadways. And we, to be honest, we kind of made a point to make sure that the people that were polled were um, likely Democratic voters, um, to be to be quite frank, <laughs> um, because that you know was an important thing with a mayoral collection, uh, mayoral um, election coming up. So, what's all this mean? What's what's been built? <clears throat> so, before I get to what has been built, I just want to go over briefly what. Um, like some of the tactics. So a big part of this program is that it's supposed to be rapid build, which is kind of contradictory in terms of a lot of bike infrastructure as it can be a not so rapid build because of the levels of, of community outreach, uh, public meetings, et cetera, that, that need to happen in order to make, to make these things happen. So, uh, you know, first of all, um, with that, there's also a whole lot of new tools that have gone in um, that, that uh, in the past couple of years that have been more accepted nationwide as well as in the city that the city has been using to make some of these um, these these connections throughout throughout Pittsburgh. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have seen the new protected bike lanes, um, you know these two stage turn boxes. So sometimes some of these facilities are just uh, improvements to existing facilities. Um, so sometimes putting in a two-stage turn box, for instance, so that you can make, which helps facilitate left turns, uh, may be part of that, that improvement. We all see share lane markings. Um, bike signals are another new tool. Um, the bus plus bike lane, that was another new tool the city has, has started using um, on Smithfield Street downtown. And the big one that came out this year, um, specifically for this program, were neighborways, which are low which the idea is to create low stress um, residential streets that, that make needed connections for bicyclists that are really useful for bicyclists. They're on the bike network, they're on the bike plan, um, but maybe it's a place where we can't say remove parking. So it's a way to, uh, to make for a low stress um, uh, connection, like needed connection. Other ways to rapidly install, and that, that includes a lot of traffic calming um, to, make, to make that happen. So um, this year we've helped put, get in these things like neighborhood traffic circles, which has shown the, uh, to slow traffic, if not discourage cut through traffic in the first place. Things like chicanes, which um, create like a, you know, a, a horizontal element that cars have to like kind of swerve around in order to like, maybe they just need to pay more attention. Speed humps, I'm sure we've all seen recently, a whole lot of speed humps have gone in. And then just simple things, sometimes just curb bump outs help, help out with, um, you know, with traffic calming, but also help pedestrians and also keep, help prevent cars from parking directly at the curb. <clears throat> uh, so a lot of that, so we have all these, this whole quiver of, of tools that we could use to make things happen. So, um, this year that some things have gone in that we're pretty excited about. Um, one thing, probably the grandest one so far has been the Gap to the Point project, um, which is uh, you know, making that connection basically from the Gap Trail, 
to the point, as the name suggests. Um, so the Gap Trail being around Smithfield Street Bridge. So this is a, uh, a, a, a network of improvements and bike lanes um, along 3rd Ave, Stanwyck Street, and Liberty Avenue downtown. So that connects to, to the Point State Park, but also connects to Penn Avenue bike lane. This has a whole lot of new elements to it um, for that are new to the city in terms uh, such as um, uh, how the bus stop, you know, the, the, the bike lane is raised up so that buses can still pull to the curb and allow people in wheelchairs to access the bus. Um, there's bike signals in, involved in this program project. Um, just as a side note, um, those bike signals at Stanwix and Penn slash Liberty um, are on a um, radar detection actually. So if you stop at the, at the stop line, it'll detect that you're there and give you the, the exclusive bike signal to get through without um, worrying about any, any cars on any, from any direction. Um, the Friendship Neighborway was another one where it was a series of traffic calming along a, a route that was parallel to Penn Avenue. Um, that also made some, there was some awkward, um, the way the streets were laid out, there were some awkward turns and one way streets and stuff like that. So the city added these little, um, these bike lanes to help make that connection legit, which people were doing anyway. Um, and uh, the, the Euclid neighborway was another one. This is from the pilot. These are gonna be turning into actual, like I had showed before the actual neighborhood traffic circles poured concrete. And these will have landscaping in them soon by the way. Um, so the one you see in Euclid there is temporary, the way that looks. Uh, Southside Neighborway is another, is another one that is a street that parallels um, East Carson Street, and then the Washington Boulevard Trail, which was, uh, which was a big connection from Negley Run over to the Cycling Oval, um, making that, that more accessible, uh, as well as the Lawrenceville Neighborway, which I showed before. Um, so, so far there's a whole lot of prog, so that was some projects that happened. Um, there, the main ones that you can see on the website, the move forward pgh.org slash projects. Um, we have a, there's a whole bunch on their way in the north side. Um, and then Shadyside Squirrel Hill also has a whole bunch of projects coming up. And then we're hoping to see, uh, the next, uh, neighborhoods clusters that will have some some uh, bike infrastructure in the south, west, and the strip in downtown, uh, connections to the strip in downtown um, are hopefully on their way. Uh, if you go to that website that I showed, um, move forward pgh.org slash projects, you can see the latest list of things that are either upcoming or in planning or, you know, or are on their way. And this is just in, in a general, this is a pretty huge jump for the city in terms of of um, being a little more transparent and clear about what projects are happening and, and so that the public can, has a place to go to now and um, see the project, click into it, see what's happening, see where the you know, public engagement is, whether it's a public meeting or a survey, um, et cetera. So that was a really big jump in terms of planning. So now we get to the part where how you can help. Glad you asked. Um, so, Obviously, the moveforwardpgh.org website, the easiest thing to do right now, if you're not on it, is just to sign up for emails that will, that basically will ensure that you get the latest on everything that's coming up. Uh, there's public meetings to attend, surveys to attend, and a really big one is just to support programs on social media. Um, as we all have seen, bike lanes and bike infrastructure get dragged um, pretty heavily in social media, and so it, it is actually really important to, um, you know, to fight that. Um, and then another thing that I want to plug is um, our advocate program at Bike Pittsburgh. Um, if you go to that, it, that website that's shown, we have like sort of a, um, a how-to on um, 101, like how to write letters to the editor and to your electeds. Um, like I said, support on social media is always good. And that sometimes it's not arguing with people, it's just giving support for stuff is really important. Um, but one that, uh, two things I really wanted to plug were becoming a member of Bike Pittsburgh is another great way if you're not already, but also um, joining your neighborhood bike ped committee. And if you're not familiar with those, um, all across the city, we have approximately, uh, there's a dozen, over a dozen 
um, neighborhood specific bike ped committees that these are their true like on the on the ground advocates who are really helping uh, push this agenda. Um, so they're not we don't necessarily run them, but we really give them support and try to guide um, and, and help out how we can. Um, but these are local advocates who are pushing for improvements within their neighborhood. They help try to push for um, projects within the budget, um, uh, the city's budget. They help out with the numerous things in terms of when a project is happening within that neighborhood. We really look to them and depend on them to help get the word out, help gar garner support, um, just generally be like on the ground. Um, you know, we've, for instance, uh, recently um, with the project on Ellsworth Ave that's in planning, um, they've been integral in helping, uh, you know, raise awareness for it, um, get the community involved, whether it's out there handing out flyers to people about the project and public meetings coming up um, or writing letters and or even doing like pop up, um, helping us with pop up bike light giveaways and things like that. One thing that we have also um, on our on this website is this uh, the grassroots advocacy toolkit. Um, which I suggest everybody check out. Um, it's for people who are involved in the bike ped committee or want to start one. So if there is, if you see a blank space in this in this map to the left, um, this toolkit will ideally help you figure out how to start one yourself. Um, uh, it kind of has like a, it basically walks you through all the steps um, it would take to to create your own bike ped committee. And like I said, they are extremely helpful. And we have um, our community organizer on staff, Anna Tang, who I'm guessing a lot of you know, um, is really tasked with helping um, make, make these things successful. <clears throat> and with that, um, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Um, I don't know how you wanna do this, Kaya, if we wanna leave this slide up or... Yeah, I, bring up I have response, not received or... any questions in the chat. So, you know, send them on in, folks. If you've got any questions, doesn't have to be, you know, totally related to the presentation. We can we can talk about anything. But uh, yeah, thank you so much, Eric. We appreciate you unmuting people or is it just in the chat? Um, you can feel free to unmute yourself or let's see. We have Seth is raising his hand so I can. Yeah. Seth, are you unmuted now? Yep, can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome, so this is, I guess, kind of in support, and, and Eric, you kind of touched on it, in support for bike lanes. I know Bike Pittsburgh has stepped away from enforcement, but I know it's still kind of epidemic level of people parking in bike lanes. Is there a strategy outside of, I mean, I guess, building infrastructure and, and kind of maybe hardening that infrastructure so it's not possible to park, or are there other strategies you think we can take outside of enforcement? Uh, yeah, that's, a really, that's, a, that's a really good question. Thanks, Seth. And also an evolving question. I should say that the, we have stepped away from armed enforcement is, is, a, is a big part of that. Um, so we have not stepped away from parking enforcement, um, just, just to, be, to be clear. Um, so uh, the, um, yeah, we, we definitely do take the fix it first approach or what we like to call self-enforcing streets. Um, as the best approach, but we understand also that's not possible in every location. Um, so in terms of parking itself, yeah, this, this, you know, quite honestly, while I said we haven't stepped away from parking enforcement, we've also found it hasn't been very successful to have enforcement in, in, in terms of parking. As you can, as we all know, people think that sidewalks are also places where they can park. Um, and so it's, it's a really difficult um, situation, um, you know, for us, because the way that the whole, the way that the whole, that we're tasked to deal with this problem is to, the, the city directs us to call 911, and which is something that we have basically, that I think everybody can agree is probably not the best uh, solution to this problem, is to call 911 every time something happens, especially when it's every day. Um, as we have seen the Penn Ave bike lane. And so, you know, it's gonna be a case by case basis, but for Penn Ave bike lane, for instance, we have been pushing for and still are pushing for, um, you know, somewhat successfully, and hopefully we'll, we will be seeing that come, come by the end of this year is basically making the, it difficult to impossible for people to park in that bike lane. Um, but in other places it, it's, you know, 
<laughs> I'll be honest, it's something, it's, it's something that, that it's a tough nut to crack. And um, it is, you know, we have found that in a lot of situations that part protecting the bike lanes um, is a, with uh, bollards has been successful in a lot of places. Um, but also one thing that we have been pushing for is parking protected bike lanes, um, which both preserves parking um, and so allows people to park as well as pr uh, provide a, a protected facility. Um, and so that's something that is, I'll call semi-legal at the moment. Um, it is, if the city wants to install it with their own money on their own streets, they can. But if they want to get statewide funding or federal funding or install it on a state-owned street, that's basically impossible at the moment. So we've been um, on a uh, basically a two-year campaign to try to legalize parking protected bike lanes um, in the city. So, you know, and also just as we as as things develop, people get more used to different types of infrastructure, at, like that stuff I showed earlier. And so, you know, every year we gain more and new. Um, tools in our toolbox, so to speak, that I think could help that situation. That was a lot, really long-winded response. So hopefully I somehow answered the question. <laughs> no, I, I, I thanks, Eric. I, I, I wrestle with that as well. And I, I think I'll use that language where you've, you've stepped back from armed enforcement. I think that's a good um, you know, strategy, at, at least in the interim. Um, because I, I live in Mount Lebanon now, and they have a, an anonymous tip line, but it kind of just goes into the ether but I also don't want to be relying on the police for traffic enforcement or, or people parking on sidewalks, which even in Mount yeah. Lebanon and most of the South Hills slopes is an epidemic. You know, I, I lived in Bonaire and people park on the sidewalk as a right, essentially. So yeah, it's yeah. like you said, tough nut to crack. Yeah. And, and I should say like the, the kind of the, the problem we see in Pittsburgh is the, um, you know, we have the parking authority who are not armed enforcement <laughs> um, but they really only deal with um, really specific situations like meters like metered areas and um, as well as street sweeping um, so anything outside of that they're not really equipped to deal with so they're not really equipped to deal with there's somebody parked in a bike lane they don't they, they send the armed police out and so that's something that we've been trying to push for like how to how do we change that like you know I think for the most part, people are just looking for, you know, a ticket and not, you know, an armed officer that, to show up that where things, as we have seen, um, can escalate uh, in place in ways that nobody wants. Thank you for that. Um, any other questions? I, I haven't received anything in the chat, I don't think, but feel free to raise your hand. I can unmute you and... Feel free to ask any questions. Very easy audience here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to bring up an issue. Uh, this is Yale. Um, with the proliferation of uh, e-bikes, um, we're seeing a lot more people who aren't that experienced riding on the roads, on the trails, especially on the trails, we see that. And I'm just wondering uh, if there's anything in planning in terms of um, educating, um, addressing some of these issues. Again, the, the, the trails are now, there are more people, less experience. The average speed on the trail is now lots on the trails. And again, as well as on the roads, um, uh, people are, are faster now, and there are definitely issues there. I mean, I would suggest it would be nice to have some kind of uh, safety blitz where, or I guess Bike Pittsburgh does the light, light giving out lights or doing that in the next few days, but even uh, showing literature and reviewing safety with people, yeah. et cetera, and if there was any kind of uh, you know, there's got to be certain write-ups and literature that we can pass out to try to educate people more on this and to address it. That's a good question, Yale. Um, so first, I want to just wanted to say that the bike plan has that plus in it for a reason, um, and that that plus the words we call the bike plus plan is to recognize that there's a whole lot of new um, types of of devices that the bike plan will sort of encompass, and that includes e-bikes. 
as well as maybe someday um, scooters, if they have electric scooters, if they ever get legalized in Pennsylvania. Um, so sort of give give a little bit of like recognize that that's that that's an emerging technology. But yeah, you're right. The, the education around it needs to catch up to what's happening now. And you know, we've had I don't know 100 plus years of bicycle education, but e-bikes are fairly new and getting more popular by the minute. And um, it is something that um, that we you know we definitely need to to address. Um, we are. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot or say that we are going to do this at the moment, but we are, um, you know, these kind of comments are really appreciated because we are rethinking our education department at the moment. Um, so things like that, I think are, you know, so I'm really glad you brought that comment up. Um, I can't say that we have something planned at the moment, um, but, but, you know, I, 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 I definitely agree with you that it is necessary and I'm, I'm seeing the problem out there as well. Um, you know, I think e-bikes, you know, are great are going to be a great resource for people to to not drive and and get out and leave the car at home, um, and just make getting around town easier by on two wheels. But um, yeah, you're there. There is this um, this level where they they are a little bit harder to uh, to handle, and and um, and you definitely see people uh, who maybe are less experienced on them and not following the rules. Um, so. You know, right now everything is <clears throat> is fairly new. The city's pl playing catch up. The state's playing catch up um, in terms of education and even what is legal and what isn't legal. Um, so, <clears throat> you know. Um, anyway, with that, I'll say thanks. Thanks for that comment and duly noted. Um, but at the moment, there is no official plan. Yeah, and I was I'll follow up that up with saying that. You know, we are looking at a, a partial transition of the healthy ride fleet into they're going to be releasing some e-bikes shortly. So that kind of education is absolutely going to be necessary to teach people about when everybody's able to rent e-bikes and ride them around the city. We're going to have to, you know, have some sort of push of education around that. So I, I definitely think that'll be something that we are going to be working to address as soon as that rollout occurs. Yeah, thanks, Kay. I, I, I forgot to mention that. So thank you yeah. for bringing that up. Yeah, I, I don't have any particular details on exactly when that's going to be, but I know our friends at Healthy Ride are working very hard to make that happen right now. So um, stay tuned. Um, we do have some chat questions. Sandra would like to know, um, from your perspective, what have been some of the challenges and opportunities for the Shady Side Squirrel Hill planning and implementation? Well, I guess I'll start with the challenges. Uh, <laughs> I'll say everywhere, for every project, the biggest challenge is always the P word, parking. Parking, parking, parking. It's the first, I, you know, as a bike advocate, I spend more time talking about parking than even bicycles. Um, you know, the, so how to figure out, um, you know, where, what parking is, where parking is, um, say, oversupplied and undersupplied, um, where, you know, people have, uh, you know, and, and what's, and also what's happening in those, in the parking, you know, not all parking is the same. Some parking is obviously like, you know, in areas where there's row homes and there's no driveway, then people obviously have to put their cars on the street. Um, you know, but there's other areas where maybe the parking dynamics are different and it's not so much residents. Like if it's a neighborhood that has very few car owners, but a lot of on-street parking, maybe there's something else going on and, and figuring out why people are parking there. Are they just parking there because it's free and they're just parking there as using it as a park and ride lot so that they can jump on the bus for free, you know? So there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot of dynamics that, that happen and parking is the thing that, that, you know, basically is the reason a project can or cannot happen. <laughs> um, uh, so, and, and people, you know, as, as I'm sure we've all seen in Pittsburgh, people uh, feel very connected to their parking space, <laughs> um, especially when it's, when it's in front of, of their house, even though sometimes it's a public parking area situation. Um, so, as far as to challenges, that that's got to be the, the number one challenge I've seen. Everybody, everybody can agree that safety is important, and that bike, even that bike lanes, in my mind, people agree that bike lanes are important. 
but a lot of people are not willing to do the trade-off for, <laughs> for, uh, for parking. Um, so that's why cer certain, um, another challenge um, I'll say we've had with some of this is, um, is uh, especially with the parking with, with protected bike lanes is um, a challenge that we see here in Pittsburgh and, and elsewhere is that when you put a protected bike lane in, you still have to also deal with ADA requirements <clears throat> in terms of um, making sure that buses can pull to the curb um, so that someone who's in a wheelchair um, can, can board the bus because you know what the way it works now is a bus can pull to the curb. There might not be a, a curb ramp there for the wheelchair to, to you know, get off the curb. So the bus ramp will actually go to the sidewalk and then someone can roll right onto the bus. Super important, super valuable, um, understandably. But what happens is when you actually protect a bike lane that limits the, the um, a bus's ability to get to the curb. So how do you deal with that? Well, then one other way to, one way to deal with that is to raise the bike lane up. And that's why you see the bike lanes raised in, on Stanwix, or on, um, sorry, on Liberty Avenue, and, oh yeah, and Stanwix in downtown so that a, um, basically somebody in a wheelchair can cross the bike lane into the bus. So it's important to like, when you see a bus pulling up um, to a bus stop there, you need to slow down and, allow, and make sure that people can get on and off safely. And they always paint those areas in, in bright green. And so um, uh, anyway, that, that's been a pretty, pretty big challenge because it, it, it uh, creates a huge amount of cost burden on the project itself. So you go from a project that goes from paint to now you're pouring concrete or, or asphalt and, and having to use a lot more um, expensive um, uh, interventions and expensive, um, you know, uh, more thermoplastic, which is can be expensive, the markings and stuff like that. So in terms of challenges, we've seen that that basically uh, be the deal killer on some projects. Um, as far as opportunities go, um, you know, while the project itself is a challenge, I think this program um, has brought the opportunity of Ellsworth Avenue um, into light. Um, it's one of the most biked corridors in the city. And, um, you know, it's as it doesn't, in short, it doesn't work for anybody. It doesn't work if you're driving. It doesn't work if you're walking. It doesn't work if you're riding a bike. And so there's been a whole lot of energy around doing something on Ellsworth. And what that something is, is not, quite clear, but the, um, what I think has um, occurred with this program and this project specifically is that it really brought a lot of people together in terms of uh, stakeholders coming together to think through the issue, think through what can be done, what's really necessary. You know, one of the issues we see on Ellsworth and everybody in the corridor recognizes is that it's used as a cut through where, you know, if you're trying to get from <clears throat> one side of Ellsworth to the other, maybe Fifth Avenue is better for you or Center Avenue or Bomb Boulevard. And so how do we figure out how to, how to eliminate or reduce the numbers of people who are using it as a cut through because they think it's a shortcut while still allowing access to businesses and homes and, and you know, to churches and, and schools and whatnot. So it's really caused everybody to really rethink like, okay, well, what, what are things that we can do and try out that could still allow people to access all the things they need to do while also eliminating that cut through. And if there is something, if something emerges from that, that is, that is useful, I think we'll, the opportunity is that we'll hopefully be able to see that in other similar, um, similar streets in the city. Thanks for the Great. question. Yeah, thank you. We have a, a couple more um, tying into the, the kind of challenges with protecting bike lanes. Chris would like to know what plans there might be to improve cleanliness of some of the lanes, particularly the protected lanes. Yeah, that is another challenge. Um, I will say, um, you know, there's two challenges there, which is the, um, you know, street sweeping in the summer and snow plowing in the winter. Um, so the snow plowing in the winter is the easier one to deal with because the city has, can put plows on, if they have smaller trucks, they, they have some equipment. Um, to do that, the, the street sweeping is the harder one if it's protected. And to, you know, this is where the, a lot of the trade-offs happen with design. Um, you know, when you have the two-way protected bike lanes, such as Penn Avenue, they're able to get a street sweeper in it. 
But when you have a one-way protected bike lane, like you see on Forbes Avenue in, in Oakland, there's no street sweepers. They just literally don't have street sweepers that can, that can clean that. So at least in that situation, they work with Pitt um, to help clean, clean the bike lanes um, in the protected bike lanes in that area. But not every neighborhood has a University of Pittsburgh to help out with that. And so the city is, knows they need to acquire this equipment. Um, you know, it's not cheap. Um, they are, you know, it's one of those things like we get the bike lanes in and then you figure out all the things you need to do to maintain them. So now they're in the process of trying to figure out how to procure those. And then once you get to that point, it's not quite as simple as just like, oh, now we have this machine. They have to make sure that each individual uh, DPW district has the machine. So, or figuring out how to share them, et cetera. So there's a lot of logistics involved in it. Um, it's, it's a lot more complicated than I ever imagined um, getting into this, thinking like, oh, I just want some bike lanes. Um, but then when you actually like, you know, start talking to the people who have to implement it, you know, it's never quite as simple as that. <laughs> um, so they are working on, with, long story short is they are working on procuring that equipment. Hopefully they will um, soon, but I, I honestly don't know when that's gonna happen, but we're very aware that it's an issue. A <clears throat> uh, couple questions from Seth. I'm just gonna roll both your questions into one. Um, Seth says, really love the Bike Plus plan, but have we missed the window to address the retail roving, roving robots? <laughs> <laughs> well, that that did happen after the Bike Plus plan. Um, so, you know, whoops. But um, I don't, I'm not sure if the roving robots would be um, included in that. I got to give the city uh, some credit on this. They they actually have a, um, they have a staffer who was hired to deal with autonomous vehicles, not these things at first, but the, you know, the Uber, well, formerly Uber, Aurora, Argo, et cetera, um, to help be the city liaison with with those companies. And then those roving, ro the delivery robots happened. And so those all got lumped into her, um, into her, like under her umbrella. Um, so she, she has been, her name's Erin Clark. She's been really on it with, in turn, there's a committee of advocates that, um, that she looks to to help inform um, her on issues that arise. She has direct line with PennDOT on, on how that, that whole thing is um, playing out. And so, and they've, They've been fair, pretty good advocates, um, I think, in trying to push PennDOT to be um, to give the city more leeway in terms of, of these robots. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to say we all we all missed the boat on that. I mean, I don't think anybody, very few people knew that that bill was even that legalized them in the state of Pennsylvania was even happening as it was rushed through. Um, so it was a surprise to to everybody. Um, not gonna not gonna try to paint the, paint a better picture on that. Mm -hmm. um, second question from Seth was uh, really looking forward to when we can talk about bike parking. Interested in the concept, the Uni Pod is that is that correct? Is bringing to NYC is secure bike parking on the radar here in Pittsburgh? Uh, a little bit. Um, so one project that we worked on with the parking authority um, was the Third Avenue Garage. Um, secure bike parking. It's not the pod because it's, it's already indoors, but um, basically they, we worked on a, a caged in area that you get a, a key fob to that then you can access and then lock your bike inside of a caged in area. So the only people who have access to your bicycle are other people with the key. Integrating that into the whole parking authority, you know, um, leasing system, which was really cool. Um, as far as those other pods go, I haven't seen other place, other the city itself working on that. Um, but what I have seen is like the universities kind of doing that or other kinds of um, businesses. Um, so we work, you know, my coworker Christine has, you know, has worked with businesses to have secure bike rooms. Uh, we worked with, in the past, we worked with Uber formerly, or now formerly Uber, now Argo on a bike room. Uh, for their employees and, and things like that. So it's more of an individual basis. Great. Um, Yale would like to know, why aren't there bike lanes on Butler from Highland Park to 50th or so? There's plenty of room and no parking. Is it a state road? I will answer your question that yes, Butler is a state road, but maybe you can say more about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, 
it is a state road. Um, it, you know, it's funny, we actually just had a conversation this morning with the city about this. Um, you know, they, they are, as part of this move forward program, they are tasked with, with looking at that street right now. And, um, you know, it's a matter of what can be done. It's not quite correct that there is no parking. <clears throat> there are sections, a lot of those sections do have parking. It's just that people park on the sidewalk. So then it, it, it plays in the question, like if you do do something on there, well, then we should do something to, so that people can park safely on the street, um, which then frees up the sidewalk. So it's, and then yes, it is a PennDOT road, which is also always a limiting factor on a lot of pro projects. Um, they have ultimate say on a lot of, a lot of the issues. So um, in short, they are looking at it at the moment. Um, I don't know what's gonna happen with it, um, but you know, they're, they are tasked with looking at it. So hopefully we'll see something come out of it. Yeah. Um, question from Ben, anything we can do about dangerous sewer grates and holes and pipes in many of the bike lanes? Whew. Yeah, so <clears throat> there was a point, there was one brief moment where, um, where the sewer authority actually had a, a, a program uh, where you could tweet at them and, and help get those replaced. And it was working on a couple, you know, it did work. Um, I have noticed that our, our, a lot of ours, 311, I will say, is the best place at the moment, while we all know that that could take forever. Um, I have noticed that majority of ours are either the bike safe ones or the semi bike safe ones where the, we don't have the, the parallel, um, you know, the ones that run along, along the, your, your line of path, they're all at, a lot of them are at an angle. Um, but they are still not there. Those are the ones I would call the semi bike friendly ones because you're not going to fall in, but you could still obviously slip on them or if you hit it wrong, you could fall in. Um, but uh, right now, the best I, I wish I had a better answer for that, but 311 is the best place. And and, you know, we have been I have seen been success, uh, seen success with this, with getting these replaced. Often it, it is the best time to do it is when they're um, doing road work or doing you know, that, that's the time to really like nod them to replace a whole bunch at once because they're in there doing the road work anyway. If they have to order new sewer grates, we might as well get them to do the, you know, bike friendly one. And I have seen them be responsive to that. And I'll also say um, 311 somewhat seems to prioritize based on the volume of requests for certain things. So if you have friends who are also concerned, submit like multiple 311 requests about the same issue and you might get a bit more responsivity from DPW. And, that. and I'd say I'd say that a lo your local bike ped committees are that's a really great that would be a really great project for a local bike ped committee to take on to then help figure out you know all the necessary steps to, to especially if there's like sometimes it's one sewer grate that needs to be fixed so sometimes you know the local bike ped committees are a perfect resource to help figure out how to make that happen because it's not always the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, Daniel would like to know, are there any plans to add signage at uh, popular entrances to the river trail system, i.e. sign at the entrance of 2nd Ave or Greenfield Ave that says downtown four miles, Point State Park four and a half miles. I um, think this would be useful to people to make them aware of what attractions the trail can lead to. Yeah, so the Bike Plus plan does talk about wayfinding in it. Um, it is something that, that um, I, I also agree would be um, very useful. The, um, they have been adding more wayfinding, especially with the, uh, the new neighbor ways. So if you see the, if you go, if you go on any of the neighbor ways, they, at, at the time of installation, they've also installed things like you're saying, like, you know, children's hospital, quarter mile or whatever it might be. Um, so they have started to do that. And, I, and the idea is that as they build out some of this infrastructure, they will include it as, it, as they go along. Um, but as far as an overall plan, um, that doesn't really um, exist uh, at the moment, um, but um, I could see the trails also also being part of the the, the earlier plan um, for for that implementation because a lot of those do have some signs, but you're 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 right there there are they could definitely use some more. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of wayfinding signs, um, I'll bring up Ben's Ben's comment from earlier about 
more signage downtown on Penn Avenue or any areas where there's two way bike lanes, potentially there could be more signage put in to get folks to look both ways for bikes and not just the one way that the cars are coming. Um, yeah. yeah, any other any other questions? I don't see anyone else in the chat, but we have a couple more minutes here if there's any any remaining questions. No. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you being here. Again, if you are interested in becoming a member of Bike Pittsburgh, if you're not already a member of Bike Pittsburgh, this is the month to join. You get a free gift um, if you join or renew this month. There's some awesome information on our website. I put it in the chat earlier, but I believe it's bikepgh.org slash membership. Um, and we are also hosting commuter cafes on Friday for our normal bike to work day sort of activity. So if you join or renew or come see us at a commuter cafe, we can join or renew the membership at that point. Um, please feel free to reach out with any questions. Eric's email is on the screen there. Eric, did you have any closing words? Just uh, thanks for hanging out with me and, and listening uh, and hearing about the whole Move Forward program and bike planning in Pittsburgh in general. So thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.